Episode number 546 of Observations is brought to you by the first annual Intergalactic Imagination Connoisseurs Film Festival. Everyone's available. Well, you might not be available, but if you are, to make a film, you have until December 1st to enter. And remember, this is the first film festival in human history that is open to all extraterrestrial life. We understand you might not have PayPal or any other kind of well, remuneration, so we're waiving the fee if you can prove you are indeed an extraterrestrial. Again, you have until December 1st to enter your film. You know you've always wanted to make one. Now's your chance. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your archbishop of Banterbury, your chancellor of cheerfulness, your pharaoh of physical media, and of course, your existential, Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett, Rob casting at you. You, Imagination Connoisseurs, you members of this, the Post-Geek Singularity, welcome to Rob Observations, episode number 546, my God. You know, today's topic, everyone was, um, everyone was talking to me about this. Everybody sent this link to me. Rob, have you seen this? What is your take on this? What do you think? And yes, I did. But since so many people asked, I figured I'd make it our lead topic, and that's, of course, about Amazon argues that their users don't actually own purchased Prime Video content, even though it does, there's buttons. You can purchase it or you can rent it. But really purchasing it isn't purchasing it, it's just an extended rental. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that on this show. However, there is breaking news, ladies and gentlemen, breaking news that all of you imagination connoisseurs are going to want to hear about, and I want to talk about it. So, um, might affect many of you. Uh, here is the breaking news. Let me uh, let me jump into it. Uh, let me just. I, I didn't. Uh, I, I'm not putting it up on the screen because I didn't have time. <clears throat> Netflix to raise U.S. prices on certain tiers. First hike in prices since January of 2019. This is by Patrick Hips or Hypes maybe. Uh, dropped at 104 on Deadline. Netflix is raising the subscription price to its standard and premium plans in the U.S. The first such hikes at the streaming giant since January of 2019. The service confirmed Thursday that it is raising the price of its HD standard plan to $13.99 from $12.99. Only a buck. And its 4K premium plan to $17.99 from $15 over the next two months. Now, Netflix has also said they're going to cut their 4K stream in half, but somehow be able to provide the same amount of quality. And if you have a 4K TV and you are currently enjoying 4K or 4K HDR of any kind, that is a, that's a $3 a month hike. You know, 36 bucks a year, that's not so bad. Um, but still... If you're paying extra money, they better give you extra. They, I mean, you got to get the, the best quality, right? The prices take effect today for new members, with current subscribers to be notified 30 days ahead of their price increase based on their billing cycle. The entry-level plan remains fixed at $8.99 per month. We understand people have more entertainment choices than ever, and we're committed to delivering an even better experience for our members. The company said in a statement, we're updating our prices so that we continue to offer more variety of TV shows and films in addition to our great fall lineup. As always, we offer a range of plans so that people can pick a price that works best for their budget. Shares were up 4% on the news in late afternoon trading after the price change news came out. They were down a tick after hours. The possibility of a price hike has been floated around Netflix, Netflix analyst circles. In September, Alex Gaimo of Jeffries noted a shift tone between remarks from management 
on the first quarter earnings call in April to the second quarter call in July. He said an increase of $1 to $2 a month in North America or Europe could generate $500 million to $1 billion in fiscal 2021 revenue. In January 2019, Netflix raised its subscription prices by 13 to 18 percent, the steepest since the company began streaming video more than a decade ago. So <clears throat> I have to say um, I'm not surprised by this, and nor do I think it's a bad thing. You know, I think of all the streamers, the amount of material that Netflix is cranking out there and providing for you, and the amount of money they are talking about putting into their programming, I mean, they're they're hideously, they're in hideous amounts of debt compared to what they deliver, and <clears throat> I think it's a good plan. However, I would expect if you're they're charging more for 4K, and obviously when you're watching things in 4K, it's, it's, um, you're dealing with more data being shoved through the pipes. So I understand. Uh, I just want to make sure that if you are paying for 4K, you should get premium 4K, not like choked off 4K. So I think that's an important thing to consider and to find out. Um, because if you are not getting the full... Uh, well, anyway, look, what do I care? I, I like physical media. So, and by the way, like I said, uh, well, not like I said, not by the way, physical media is still the best way to watch movies. And if you have a home theater system, it's even better. I'm not saying that Netflix can't deliver something that's, you know, good, but it's not as good as physical media yet. But before I jump into this Amazon story, I watched the third episode of Star Trek Discovery, People of Earth. And I think this might, this episode has convinced me that it's, maybe it's time to hang up those Star Trek spurs. Um, because I just, I can't get over the stupid. And it, it's very funny how people try, Here, here's, here's the thing. And, and I, I, you know, I'm not going to sit there and, and tell you if you're enjoying it, you shouldn't watch it. I can only tell you why I don't like it. You see, science fiction as a genre has always been a way to interestingly reflect back on our own civilization and, and provide, you using sci-fi as a literary genre, it's a prism by which to examine our own culture through the science fiction lens. And all the best science fiction makes any kind of political or social or economic or environmental commentary, it makes it a lot more palatable and delicious because it wraps it up in a science fiction bow. So really, all science fiction, remember, is actually a reflection of our society, of human culture now. <clears throat> Great science fiction should offer all of us insight into the world we live in. Now, the very premise of Star Trek Discovery is that they, they've gone basically 900 and change, 900 years into the future. Now, in doing this, they've, when, they've, when they got to the future, they've discovered that a little over 150 years before they got there, so 800 years in Star Trek's future, there was something called the burn. And what the burn is, is that all dilithium exploded or it became inert or whatever. In this week's episode, they literally show you a picture of like 100 starships all clumped together exploding. So you get the idea that, oh, okay, every ship, I guess, that was at warp or, or just all the dilithium exploded. All right. However, they've now spent three episodes with people getting dilithium. There's just not... Uh, uh, much of it anymore so apparently not all of the dilithium exploded only the dilithium that was in ships or being refined or on i don't know but there's still dilithium and everybody wants it which okay one that doesn't make sense but let's talk about how sci-fi reflects back on human culture you're talking about before the burn there was 800 years of technological advancement in the star trek universe now, the original series takes place in the 23rd century. That's when Discovery takes place. And if you look at the advances, let's just look at our world. The advances in technology that have occurred here in even the last 30 years. Now, imagine that 800 years from now. Theoretically, our society should look very, very different with the way things like biotech and medical technology is increasing, the way uh, computer technology is increasing, even things, even even the fact that Elon Musk can now land rockets at sea 
on platforms from orbit is something that five years ago we couldn't do. So imagine what technology in the Star Trek universe would look like in 800 years, which is almost three times as far away from the, the Star Trek universe, the original Star Trek universe in 66 was from what our time was going to look like. And that was just speculation. So within the Star Trek universe, the technology would be pretty much unrecognizable. And, and we know that from <coughs> other Star Trek episodes, there's all kinds of different propulsion systems. We know even in the time of the original series, there are hidden alien races that have technology to beam people across the galaxy. Gary Seven in the episode Assignment Earth being one of them. There's, there's the Q continuum. I mean, would Q himself, assuming he's around in 800 years, since he loves humanity so much and since they're watching us, whatever happens in the... But let's say they, they, they decide that the burn was caused by those evil... Uh, the evil AIs that don't like sentient or the, the they don't like artificial life forms, and they've spent, you know, years, decades, maybe centuries, sending little nanotech devices that that infected all of the dilithium. The problem is, not everybody uses dilithium for faster than light travel. We know the Romulans used controlled singularities, artificial singularities, to power their Dedaret X warships. We also know that there's subspace technology. So even if all the ships exploded, people could still talk to each other. But then they keep saying that, oh, in this week's episode, oh, subspace just stopped working. What does that have to do with dilithium? I mean, if this whole thing is going to be some kind of, ooh, we didn't know we'd been infected for so long by, I don't buy that, but because the, 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 the vastness of space, whatever. But when I watch this show, so in this show, spoiler alert, they get back to Earth and Earth looks pretty great. So I guess nobody can go anywhere, but they've clearly got very, very advanced technology. And the Discovery goes back to Earth. And, and they decide in the course of this hour, and this is what really bothers me, that they're going to go find Starfleet. They've decided that, well, somehow in the last 150 years that anything to do with Starfleet and the Federation, which, by the way, are two different things. Starfleet is part of the Federation, but... Um, and the Federation administers uh, Starfleet, but Starfleet is sort of a, just an arm of the Federation. But according to what happened here, the Federation is just gone, but Earth is rather intact. Well, wouldn't you think that with that kind of technology that the Discovery might benefit from downloading or uploading all of the historical data that they could get from Earth? By the end of the episode, everybody's all kumbaya friendly, and it's like... Uh, why don't we come down and spend some time on Earth and just get our bearings and find out where did the galaxy go in the 800 years? I, I would think people would want to go maybe find their ancestors. I mean, we see Tilly putting up things on a wall. Well, you're on Earth. You know, they don't even go back. They should have done some kind of a, an episode like Family where, okay, we're here on Earth. Let's take some bearings of where we are. We might never, ever get back to our own time. Uh, not that they're looking to do that, but wouldn't you think that they would want to get all, they, people would want to visit Earth? I mean, they go and they see one tree on the grounds of Starfleet Academy. You have a whole crew of people, not all of them are from Earth, but they wouldn't want to like go visit their ancestral homes or whatever. But more than that, wouldn't you take your entire, like whatever team you have left that deals with history or information and go get as much information as you possibly could about what's happened in the past 900 and some odd years since you jumped into the future? And then wouldn't you want to start, I don't know, visiting all the Federation member worlds first? Your next stop would probably be Vulcan. And I, I look at this and I feel like the biggest problem that I have with this, with this series, and especially I knew I was going to have this problem with going a thousand years in the future, is no one in a Star Trek show is acting like they understood what might happen if they jumped 100,000 years in the future, or a plan to deal with what we're going to find when we get there. They're acting like they've been thrown into the situation and cut off. I would have thought that they would have had a plan. And by the way, since Burnham found the Discovery, the Discovery has been in that time period for, what, a couple of days? And everybody acts like it's some 
incredible hardship, like, oh, we're acclimating. You guys are on a basically an extended mission. No one is acting like they're at all Starfleet officers. I mean, you know, a new black guy walks on the bridge, so they cut to a shot of the one black girl on the bridge besides Burnham checking him out. It's so weird. I mean, it's it's why would you do that? Why would that be even a cutaway? Why would people pay any attention to race anymore? I mean, what's strange about Star Trek Discovery, the further they get into the future, the more segregated the show seems to get, which is quite strange, to be honest. I don't, I, I, I don't understand. I mean, I do understand. It's our thinking permeating Star Trek. And it's very frustrating to watch because it's, it's odd. It, it seems to go against the grain for what they're trying to do. But every time I watch the show, the conception of it just gets dumber and dumber and dumber. And characters just don't act at all like Starfleet officers would act. And then, of course, in this episode, um, <laughs> Burnham and Saru have a conversation about him being captain and there's some trust there. And immediately then Burnham goes and basically commits mutiny again and pulls off some Hail Mary plan with Book, doesn't tell Saru and is count. She actually says, well, I'm just counting on the Enterprise crew to do the right thing. Really? I mean, in Star Trek of yore, they would all execute a plan together. But the idea that Burnham goes off and executes her own plan because, oh, she's been there for an... I, I just... I watch this and I'm like, what, what is it they're trying to tell me? What am I supposed to glean from this show? And as a, as a longtime Star Trek fan, the franchise is 54 years old. And once again, the, it, 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 nobody acts like they should act. The situations they're, they're presenting are just glossed over. So I cannot suspend my disbelief when I watch these things. Now, I guess a lot of people are, they like this show. They don't ask themselves these questions. And I understand it's kind of like viewers that want to watch special features. I know for a fact, if you want to quantify them, uh, of all the people that bought physical media, bought DVDs and Blu-rays and now 4K discs, less than 20% were interested in the special features. Now, I know all of you are going to say, oh, I've always loved the special features. Yes, that's why you're an imagination connoisseur. Most people don't care. Just like most people don't care that they are glossing over uh, uh, all of this ridiculousness. But Star Trek was always a niche show anyway. And I guess in trying to appeal to the wider mass audience, what they're doing is they're removing the very essence of what made Star Trek interesting in that it was intelligent and thoughtful. Now it's it's really been dumbed down. Literally, the mission that the Discovery is on at the end of this episode is the same mission that the Searcher was on at the second season opener of Buck Rogers in the 25th century. They're going to find Starfleet. Wouldn't, wouldn't all the information you need to find Starfleet be on Earth? It makes no sense if we look at how things, our history, our own history works. The, this idea that the burn happened and then destroyed all of the institutions, the Federation, Starfleet, whatever, that they all just disappeared is patently absurd. That's not how history works. And someone threw at me at Twitter, well, that's what happened in Rome, you know, when, yes, but Rome wasn't technologically based. You know, I mean, they didn't even know during ancient Rome that the new world existed. So I don't think that was really a great, a great example. Uh, Rome... The rest of the world, when Rome was at its height, was rather small. Now you have a whole universe. You've got member worlds. And you're asking everybody to believe that all of these member worlds dealt with the burn in the same way. You don't think the Vulcans that had spacefaring technology long before we did would have like a fix for any of this? You don't think that technology would have advanced 800 years in the future? Why are we still using dilithium? I mean, we've already seen fossil fuels and how our future with Elon Musk's battery power and electric cars, look what that look at how far that's gone in 20 years. Imagine where that technology would be in 800. I just I watch Star Trek Discovery. can't deal. Can't watch it. I can't. I, I, I think I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to tap out. The stupidity of the show is leaving me cold. And um, hey, maybe that's a shortcoming of mine. But uh, I think, you know, to me, I watch Star Trek Discovery and it's indicative of the rest of America. You know, the rest of America is basically we've had the burn over the last four years and uh, now we're falling apart. And it's very interesting. You, you, you wonder to yourselves, wait a minute, 
aren't cooler heads going to prevail? But you look at how divided we are, and maybe they're not. Maybe that's what this whole thing is. It's supposed to be some smart depiction of uh, what's going on in America for real. But they're not that smart over there because if they were, they would write smarter scripts. Anyway, don't like it. Don't dig it. And I've given I've given them three hours. Um, and next week's episode doesn't look much better. But I don't know if I'll watch it or not. Maybe someone will have to tell me. Anyway, yesterday, this dropped in The Hollywood Reporter. Ashley Collins wrote this article. Amazon argues users don't actually own purchased Prime video content. <clears throat> the streamer says its terms of use are clear. What viewers are paying for is a limited license. Well, if that's what you're paying for, shouldn't that, it, it shouldn't, instead of the word purchase, shouldn't it say limited light? You're buying a limited license. When an Amazon Prime video user buys content on the platform, what they're really saying, I got to take this off for a second, is a limited license for on demand viewing over an indefinite period of time. And they're warned that in the company's term, they're warned that in the company's terms of use. That's the company's argument for why a lawsuit over a hypothetical future deletions of content should be dismissed. In April, Amanda Claudel sued Amazon for unfair competition and false advertising. She claims the company secretly reserves the right to end consumers' access to content purchased through its Prime Video service. She filed her putative class action on behalf of herself and any California residents who purchased video content from the service from April 25, 2016 to the present. On Monday, Amazon filed a motion to dismiss her complaint, arguing that she lacks standing to sue because she hasn't been injured and noting that she's purchased 13 titles on Prime since filing her complaint. Plaintiff claims that defendant, defendant's Amazon Prime video service, which allows consumers to purchase video content for streaming or download, misleads consumers because sometimes the video content might later become unavailable if a third-party rights holder revokes or modifies Amazon's license writes attorney David Biederman in the motion, which is posted below. The complaint points vaguely to online commentary about this alleged potential harm, but does not identify any Prime Video purchase available to the plaintiff herself. In fact, all of the Prime Video content that plaintiff has ever purchased remains available. <laughs> Further, Amazon argues the site's required user arguments or agreements explain that some content may later become unavailable. The most relevant agreement here, the Prime Video Terms of Use, is presented to consumers every time they buy digital content on Amazon Prime Video, writes Biederman. These terms of use expressly state that purchasers obtain only a limited license to view video content and that purchased content may become unavailable due to provider license restriction or other reasons. Amazon argues it doesn't matter whether Claudel actually bothered to read the fine print. An individual does not need to read an agreement in order to be bound by it, writes Biederman. That's very true. A merchant term of service agreement in an online consumer transaction is valid and enforceable when the consumer had reasonable notice of the terms of service. That is true. Uh, oh, I guess that's the end of the article. And then it shows the term of service. Well, now normally, I, I wouldn't, I might have let this slide, but because... Uh, so many people wrote to me about this. I figured I'd <clears throat> I would offer my raw observations as to this. I have to say that I have to come down on the side of Amazon and anybody who's buying digital copies of anything because they are in fact owned by the license holder or who made them. It's always sort of been that way. Even videotapes. The reason there was an FBI warning at the beginning is that you can buy videotapes or you could buy Laserdisc, or you could buy DVDs, and you could buy 4K discs. But you never had the right to go, say, open your own movie theater and play those videotapes or Laserdiscs or DVDs or Blu-rays in a movie theater and charge admission. Even that, you were limited by. As everyone who had videotapes knows, you have an FBI warning at the beginning. All of that material, it was licensed for private use. And, and that's always been the case. It's always been the case. And uh, I do think, however, when you are buying something from, say, a third party like Amazon, people think that they're downloading a file and they have that file. But usually when something like that happens, depending on what service you're buying it through, 
you're connected somehow to some way or something else. Apple, you've got Apple Music and and Spotify, you're connected to Spotify somehow. So to me, I think it's fairly obvious that uh, when you are buying something from an online retailer, that you you know for a fact that that file is, I mean, if as long as your computer is talking to wherever you bought it from, it can be taken away. With physical media, if you don't have, like, nowadays people's Blu-rays and things like that are, in fact, connected to the Internet, but you can also disconnect it from the Internet. It'll still work. So uh, that's why I love physical media. I mean, I love physical media because I've been collecting. I, I was thinking about it the other day. I have been collecting physical media for now in, in May of this year, May of 2020, marked my 40th anniversary of collecting physical media. The first videotape I ever owned was Halloween, which I've talked about on the show, from Media Home Entertainment before it became Media Home Entertainment. And then I, my five, I think I had five movies after that, Allied Artists. I had um, Alice, Sweet Alice. I had Animal House. I had uh, Dark Star, VCI, John Carpenter's. I had two John Carpenter movies. Uh, I had The Exorcist from Warner Home Video with the oversized box. My dad later brought me home Crypt of the Living Dead. That was on Allied Artists' own video. Um, and then I went from there. But so 40 years. I mean, that's a long time uh, to own. If I live to be 80, half of my life would be collecting physical media. I don't know if I'll live to be 80. Uh, but if I watched one movie, I guess I could watch one movie. If I live to be 80, if I watch one movie a day that I own, I could probably get through my whole collection. Maybe, but uh, you know, I just think it's another reason. I, I think for the most part, most people aren't going to have a problem with this, and I think people should just understand that if you're downloading anything, we should we 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 should just understand that we live in a world. If you buy an Adobe license, you know, no longer do you buy software in a box and plug in a disc and download the software. I mean, you get a you, it's everything is downloadable and everything has a license fee. That's just how, that's the way of the world. That's part of the technological advancement that has happened. And I think this, I have to say, look, what's interesting to me about technology and <clears throat> companies like Amazon, I love Amazon. You know, when they first started out, it was books. And then, wow, you can get CDs and videos. I don't know when I made my first, as a matter of fact, let's see, shall we? I'm going to, let's go into my Amazon account right now. Let's see how long this should be this should be interesting i wonder how long i can go back into my account like if i go into my orders shall we shall we shall we go back and let's see you can get you can look at uh ooh i'll go to 2001 let's see what i bought in two, oh wow this is this, this should be fun isn't it let's see what i bought on amazon what did bobby b buy in 2001 for Amazon. On March 14th, 2001, I bought the book, ooh, this is a good book, By Reason of Insanity by Shane Stevens. I highly recommend it. I also bought Silent Hill 2 for the PlayStation 2. I bought Spy Hunter for PlayStation 2. I bought a special uh, edition of the movie Heathers from Anchor Bay that came in a tin I bought the Andrew Vox novel, Pain Management. Uh, this was a Burke novel. Now, what's interesting is these orders. So I placed an order on March 14th, 2001. Uh, and that's when I got By Reason of Insanity. Then the next order I placed in, at Amazon was September 25th, 2001. So that was a while. And that second order was when I got Silent Hills, Spy Hunter, Heathers, and Pain Management. On September 26th, 2001, I bought Ro Robert Charles Wilson's science fiction novel, The Chronoliths. On September 28, 2001, I bought Ico, a great PlayStation 2 game. On October 28, 2001, I bought Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty. And on October 18th, I bought uh, George Sluicer's movie, The Vanishing, from Criterion. And um, on December 2, 2001, I bought Grand Theft Auto 3 for PlayStation 2. And then on December 10th, I bought the Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty Official Strategy Guide and the Grand Theft Auto 3 Official Strategy Guide. Uh, so I placed nine orders in 2001. 
Now, let's see. All orders paid by you. Let's go back and look. It says archived orders. Now, I don't know what that means. Go to other orders. Go to your orders. To see other past purchases, go to your orders. Hmm. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. I guess that's it. That that was, I guess I began my Amazon buying career in 2001. Now I'm curious. Let's just dip into 2002 and see what, this is like weird. I've never done this before, to be honest. Let's see what I bought in 2002. Okay. Uh, in 2002, I didn't buy a whole lot from Amazon, apparently. Um, I bought Risk, the PlayStation 1 Risk game. I bought Need for Speed, Hot Pursuit 2. I bought Medal of Honor Frontline. I was buying a lot of video games back then. The Demon in the Freezer, a true story by Richard Preston. Uh, I bought John Glenn's book, My Eyes Only, My Life with James Bond, and the James Bond Legacy, 40 Years of 007 Movies. I bought uh, Itumama Tambien. I bought the movie Focus. I bought the sixth season box set of The X-Files on DVD. I bought Spetters, James Toback's Fingers, Dog Soldiers, and Roxy Music Live at the Apollo. Then I bought the entire first season of Babylon 5, Mobile Fighter G Gundam box set, which I didn't like very much. And I bought War and Remembrance on DVD on October 31st. I bought The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp and then Star Trek The Next Generation Season 6. So there you go. I know uh, I don't know what that means. It just means that I love Amazon. But there you go. There's, there's, there's a little insight into what I was buying 19, 18 and 19 years ago from Amazon. I dig it. I've always dug Amazon, and obviously Amazon has changed our lives. So that's kind of neat. Um, I'm going to jump into another a, a letter. Let's go into a letter. This just comes from James. Just James. Nothing else, just James. Hi, Rob. You have been taking a lot of heat lately from people who don't appreciate your angry rants. I'm going to take the opposite position. And here's why. After years of working as a PA transcriber and logging footage on reality shows, I finally landed the position of assistant director, assistant to the director, on a scripted show with a guarantee of 12 22-minute episodes. Congratulations. The director and crew mostly came from the reality TV shows I'd worked on, so we all worked well together. The small and diverse local cast was top-notch. We had a musical director who had done projects for Oprah, an animation director who was formerly with Disney, and an A-list Hollywood creature effects company. Wow. We set up shop in a professional studio with dedicated editing suites. There was a real feeling that the show could become a long-term ongoing series. Then there was the creator, or as he would want to be billed, creator, executive producer, writer, co-director, and whatever other credit he could get on screen. Uh-oh. Production begins. The creator has three scripts completed. Okay, no problem. Each program for the season has a basic premise in place. He's working on more. The music director has already written the songs for each episode, and they've been sent to the animator to create standalone music videos. All good. After a couple of weeks of shooting in studio and on location, things are going well. The creator has the next batch of scripts right? Nope. So the producer, who, by the way, has since written a well-received novel, bangs out a script so we can keep going. Of course, the creator hates it, and from then on insists he will write the remaining eight scripts. How many does he have now? Um, well, none. Did I mention the animation was coming from Australia? This was a time before high-speed transfer was really possible, so at the end of the day, we would start the download of animated assets and hope it completed by morning without error or corruption. It was only after the first download we discovered assets were in the PAL format, so hours of re-rendering got underway. Needless to say, the wheels started coming off. The woman who was our line producer quit. Not long after that, the woman who was our studio tape operator quit. I later found out it had something to do with inappropriate comments and advances by someone high up in the production. Hmm, I wonder who, I ask sarcastically. Scripts became things the creator had written the night before, if not that morning, and sometimes were just made up on the fly. Actors love it when that happens, again sarcastically. 
I almost quit after not getting paid for weeks and was almost fired for telling someone outside the production how it was really going. The studio manager was fired, and when an audit of the production was done, it was discovered that many billable hours of studio and editing time had not been paid. Apparently, he also had a two-for-them, one-for-me idea when ordering the Mac G5 workstations for the production. After months of just trying to make things work, the end was in sight. One more episode to deliver. Screw it, we're doing a clip show. And with that, the project mercifully came to an end. So Rob, it is actually cathartic for me every time you rant about your experience with Axinar. I can say to myself, well, at least I didn't get sued. <laughs> now, let me just say I didn't get sued either. Uh, James. James, this is a great letter. I mean, and also a great cautionary tale, as it were. Um, you know, one of the things about, about making films that a lot of people, making films or television, whenever you're creating programming, there is a methodology in place. It works. It works really well. And when you hire people to do their jobs that are professionals that have come out of working in Hollywood, they're always good at what they do, especially if they have a long time uh, or a long list of credits in the business. That's why they stay in the business. It's, uh, it's a great business to work in, but it is very difficult. It's very hard to do. And when, when other people start accusing you of not doing your jobs, for instance, I'm going to flat out say, I, I will flat out make an accusation right now. Well, I can say it because I've been accused of this so many times. When it comes to Axonar, Alec Peters has actually accused me of stealing digital assets. Uh, that's, what he, that's what he says. Now, first of all, I've made all these digital assets. I don't have a work for hire agreement, so technically anything I worked on really is mine. So I, it's impossible for me to have stolen his digital assets that I've made, first of all. Second of all, because uh, you should always have redundancies and backups, um, I asked Alec Peters to buy me two G-Ray drives, and or G-Drives, because I told him, I said, listen, I want to archive all of my work. I didn't want to lose my computers and I had tons of, of all kinds of years of video work that I did on both Prelude to Axonar and the Axonar Project. And he did that. He bought me those drives and I copied every asset that I had created. And then I repacked them. I used the drives once. I repacked them in their original boxes, wrapped them. They're even wrapped up in the, in the, pla the clear plastic they come in. And they were sitting on his desk for about six months. We worked in the same office. I worked there seven days a week. He came in for a couple hours, maybe a few times a week, but I was there every day because I also worked on three feature films in that office, one of which was Tango Shalom that's going to start playing festivals in February. Um, well, another was a Lifetime movie. But I put those drives on his desk and left them there, and they were there for about six months, and then he moved them to the side of his desk, and I kept saying, Alec, you know, you really should take these home and put them someplace and keep them safe. Well... When we moved out of that studio and Alec crossed the uh, country and moved to Atlanta, then suddenly he decided to start coming after me legally, and he says that I'd stolen all of his digital assets. He's lying. I put those drives, I gave them, they were on his desk for a long time. I have pictures. I can't prove what's on those drives, but as, as a post-production supervisor and as an editor, I know that protecting your assets is of paramount importance. It wasn't for him. He was the producer of this project and was very unconcerned. In fact, he never even asked me about archiving this material. I was the one telling him that we needed to do it. So this isn't really a rant about Axonar, but I really do resent how over the last couple of years, he's been besmirching my good name as a post-production supervisor and editor saying that I stole his assets and somehow didn't give him the drives that I was talking about. Well, that was an absolute lie on his part, and it's demonstrably provable now, as is, as, as you all know, we are making a documentary called Lords of Their Realm. Well, we have for our documentary every piece of evidence we would need if I ever get sued again by him. He, he says he's going to sue me again. I have all the evidence now I need in terms of 
money and all that, that I can finally protect myself. I didn't before, but now I do. And um, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to watch what happened to the Axonar project because of the incompetence of, of one man that has no idea what he's doing. So anyway, what are you going to do? I, um, I, um, I'm right there with you. <clears throat> Paul in Long Beach has written a letter. Uh, I, this was supposed to be read uh, Tuesday, but I, I didn't read it. Paul from Long Beach is one of our funniest members of the Post Geek Singularity community. Paul from Long Beach says, good morning, Rob. <laughs> okay. Good morning, Rob. Remember, this is supposed to be read on Tuesday. During these weird times, I just wanted to let every member of the Post Geek Singularity know just seven days from today is one of the most important events of next week. Not just for Americans, even to all the imagination connoisseurs out there that listen to this show regularly. As many of you know, here in America, next Tuesday, November 3rd, is National Sandwich Day. To all of our friends around the world, I don't care what anyone's preference is in your choice of sandwich. I just want you to join us, as is American tradition, in having a sandwich. I'm choosing sausage parmesan, and my wife Anna has chosen an eggplant parm as well. Now, I can think of almost a quarter million reasons why we've already made our choice in sandwiches, but realistically, there are only three. Because we have all the ingredients, they're already in our refrigerator. Some ingredients we've had for a while. They've just needed to be taken off the shelf and dusted vigorously. Two, it's comfort food. We consider the past few years, even more the past few months, to have been a little on the crazier side of life, and on such a seminal day, we feel like comfortable is what we will choose for our sandwich. Because of a certain film I've recently seen, I've had a hankering for a sausage parmigiana for about two weeks. Therefore, in all good conscience, Robert, I must respectively decline my participation on voting for the participating films entered in the Intergalactic Imagination Connoisseurs Film Festival, and this is due to the fact that my sandwich choice could be construed as weighing heavily in the pit of my stomach on further decisions regarding certain entries. As you know, I'm absolutely against judicial activism. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity. Cut to overhead side camera. Rob looks directly into the camera and raises a shaking fist. Damn you, wiener kill! I think that it is fair to ask, not just our American friends, but our international friends as well. What is the sandwich of Sweden and Sarajevo? What will small town Iowa or big city state capital Baton Rouge be indulging on during this most sacred of American duties? Can I get the sheriff of Nottingham and Chairman Mao to provide us with a sandwich choice? And can I put that on a resume going forward? I'm so curious and the possibilities are endless. Please, everyone, in the replies, tell me about the sandwich you are going to have next Tuesday, November 3rd, and you tell me why. I'll absolutely respond to as many as I can. Thank you for your participation in the basic democratic process. Paul from Long Beach. And remember, here in America, next Tuesday, November 3rd, is National Sandwich Day. Do your part. Well, Paul, <laughs> I'm just going to assume that that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, that's um, that's pretty fun. That is pretty fun. <clears throat> uh, this one comes from Luke Gosling. Hey, Rob, I've only written it a couple of times before, and it's been a long time since my last letter. I still watch daily, even though I can't tune in live, and I love the content. I've really enjoyed your recent interviews with the Pierce Brothers and Paul Jenkins. Very informative, and the latter was also moving. More interviews, please. Before I get into it, I wanted to say your Quibi rants have been hilarious and epic. Your last one almost caused me to fall down the stairs. I'm currently on crutches after... Oh, I read this already, but I'll keep going. I'm currently on crutches after snapping my Achilles and was laughing so hard listening to your show whilst I was hopping upstairs, I lost my balance and almost took a tumble. 
It usually takes a few gin and tonics to have that effect. Bravo, sir. I wanted to weigh in with some thoughts on the cinema. I'm in England, so I'm only giving my perspective on the cinema experience in this country under the current climate. Also, I want to prefix this by making it clear I believe people should, I think I think you meant to say preface this, by making it clear I believe people should do only what they feel comfortable doing. Like all members of the post-geek singularity, I love film, and I love nothing more than seeing a film at the cinema. Yes, sometimes the experience can be tainted, most commonly by other patrons who frankly don't know how to act in a civil society, but honestly, they are few and far between. No matter how good you think your setup at home is, unless you're a millionaire, it really can't compare with the big screen and thundering sound offered at the cinema. I'm a member of one of the cinema chains here in England, the Odeon, which allows me to see as many films as often as I like. On that, I'd say I average once a week. I work from home as a writer and filmmaker, so going to the cinema gets me out of the house and gives me a shot of creativity. During the pandemic lockdown, I really missed going to the cinema, and I couldn't wait to get back once they reopened after four months. I went eight times within the first month or so to watch a selection of older films like Inception and Jurassic Park and new releases like Tenet and the New Mutants. On a side note, for the people complaining about how loud Tenet was, go and rewatch Jurassic Park. When the T-Rex attacked the vehicles in the rain, the seismic roar almost dislodged my kidneys. <laughs> anyway, back to the main thread. In all my recent cinema visits, I can't praise the cinema highly enough for their operating procedures during this tricky time. I can honestly say that they have created the safest public environment I've been in, which includes going back to restaurants, pubs, shops, and supermarkets. There is distancing, sanitizer, and mask wearing. Cinemas are doing their best. So I'm really dismayed that some studios have taken the decision to put the brakes on on new releases. Now I understand it's a financial decision, but from a recent article I read, a study found that there have been no links between COVID cases and the cinema anywhere in the world. I believe studios should be backing cinemas by releasing the big tentpole movies, which shows faith in the industry and in turn would help build confidence in the audience and encourage people back to the cinema. Now I know a lot of U.S. cinemas are shut down, but much of the rest of the world is currently open for business. I take my hat off to Warner Brothers and Christopher Nolan for giving it a go with Tenet. Film fans should be appreciative they tried, but I've seen some film commentators on social media angry at them for daring to do so and pleased that it failed. I don't understand this attitude. Also, I'm fed up with some people complaining about movies being pushed. If you're not prepared to help the industry by going to the cinema, what do you think is going to happen? You're not going to see the blockbusters anytime soon because VOD isn't a viable option. Man, I was geared up for James Bond and Dune. You and me both, brother. I'm in my late 30s with no underlying health problems other than weak tendons, so I'm happy to go places. I do still wear a mask while sitting in the cinema, even though you don't have to. I'm happy to play Russian roulette if the safety's on. <laughs> I want to reiterate, please only do what you're comfortable doing during, your, during these worrisome times. I'm only speaking for myself. The British government are screwing the arts by keeping so many other sectors closed and calling for people to re retain or retrain in what, I don't know, but that's another letter. We need to support the cinema by going or it will fail. I'm seeing Back to the Future and Rocky this weekend, and I can't wait. Stay safe, post-geek singularity, and thanks for reading my letter, Rob. All the best, Luke Gosling. That is a great letter. I don't think I've read that before. Um, I, uh, I really like that. So, um, thank you. Thank you for writing that in. This one comes from Mason A. Good day, Rob. I was surfing through the Disney Plus catalog when a thought occurred to me. With the coming release of The Mandalorian, do you think we will also see another season of the Disney Gallery show about the making of the series? That's a good question. I look forward to watching your reply. Thanks. Live long and prosper from Mason A. Uh, for everybody who might have forgotten, do you know what tomorrow is? Tomorrow's Mandalorian morning. If you're not going to stay up till midnight tonight to watch the first episode of The Mandalorian Drop, Season 2, Mandalorian tomorrow, Coffee Mandalorian, and then the John Campia show. I'm looking forward to it. Woohoo! Beskar Armor's back, baby! So's Baby Yoda! So's the Razor Crest! X-Wings! TIE Fighters! Moff Gideon! Woohoo! Cara Dune! Hubba Hubba! I'm waiting. Uh, I do think they'll probably do. Like, why not? It's, it's programming they can create concurrently and wrap it into the budget. Uh, actually, it probably is covered under the marketing budget. Uh, I would I would like to see that. I, I hope I really hope they focus now that the the secrets of the Mandalorian are out, maybe not the plot secrets, but I, I would like to see a lot more examination into how the show is actually physically made 
Uh, I, I would watch a half an hour of just fly on the wall behind the scenes footage of them shooting the episodes. Um, so yeah, I think so. I think, I think we're going to, uh, we're going to see that. And, um, yeah, I think so. Uh, and our friend, uh, Pedro Ferreria, Ferreria, uh, Ferreira, Ferreira, I, and pa Pedro, I always get it wrong. I'm sorry. Um, this one, uh, hi Rob, I wish to talk to you about something that I've touched on in the past about Star Trek that's been bugging me. Modern Star Trek or the franchise under Alex Kurtzman has become politically one-sided. Putting aside the problems with continuity and how the characters are written, one of the biggest franchise issues by far is it leaning f to its far-left political ideology. I've spoken in the past and maintained that Star Trek always used to be partisan, which is why people from both the left and the right could enjoy it. The franchise has always had, I think I've read this one too, has always had left-wing and right-wing content or ideals. I know this escapes a lot of fans who assume that being progressive means being left-wing. It's possible to have regressive ideologies and be left-wing, though. Star Trek can be progressive without being biased towards a political side. I'm not going to talk about how Star Trek has left-wing and right-wing content, as I've already explained how in a previous letter you read out. However, as I've mentioned in the past, I go with centralism so I can see how society has shifted toward far-left politics. I do not like to be pulled politically to either side. Unsurprisingly, a lot of Star Trek fans see current Star Trek as the best Star Trek because it's now leaning towards being left-wing. Is that a good thing? How do you have ying without yang? The writing never told you what to think politically, but since Discovery began identity politics is what the show sold itself on for some reason. That's true. The franchise in its current state definitely feels corrupt. Why do I mention this now? You may have heard that in your country there's a certain election coming up and boy have the costs of Star Trek or the cast of Star Trek been busy. Go anywhere near a social media site that mentions Star Trek and you see people like Marina Sirtis urging Star Trek fans to vote for Joe Biden. It goes without saying, or maybe it needs to be pointed out due to a lack of common sense, that asking fans to vote for a political side is just wrong. Let's not forget Biden recently held a charity fundraiser using Star Trek's name. Very clever, Mr. Biden. Perhaps Trump has done something similar with Trek, although I haven't found any mention of it on social media, so apologies. Regardless of whether you're a big fan of Donald fake, Trump, fake News Trump or Joe Buy Them Certus isn't alone, but she seems to be one of the main people along with George Takei as well as many others. Do they not understand that the future of humanity shown in the franchise has rejected politics? Leave future politics to the Cardassians and the Bajorans. Humanity of the future is supposed to be more enlightened. I know I will probably get in trouble with some listening to this, but I have to say that the people involved in promoting the franchise for their own political bias, well, there's no easy way to say this, deep breath. They should have been ashamed of themselves and their behavior. They can favor one individual politically over the other, but to urge fans to support their views in the name of the franchise feels corrupt. Uniting the fan base isn't done this way. This kind of thinking is dividing the fan base, creating a it's either us or them mentality. They've fallen into the same traps the future presented in Star Trek seeks to avoid. Let me tell you an interesting Twitter incident that occurred to me shortly after my bedroom ceiling decided to come on down. On a side note, you could still walk around absolutely fine upstairs. It's just the thick ceiling plaster or whatever it's called that came down, exposing all of the wood above. Anyway, back on topic, I was on, a Star, I was on Star Trek Twitter and got annoyed with a far-left fan for using a Generations gift to describe their love of Kurtzman Trek. I have mentioned before how this annoys me, although I'm not gatekeeping like they think I am. As predicted, I was ganged up on by the far left or more far left leaning fans, and the conversation turned into a political discussion. One person went completely off topic, complaining I didn't support gay rights and Black Lives Matter, which came out of nowhere because I never even mentioned those things. But more worryingly, one individual fan criticized me for being too conservative, saying he supports rioting out in the streets and causing harm to others if it gets the result he wants. Star Trek, in his eyes, has taught him that change can only happen with violence, casualties being a necessary evil if it leads to the greater good. I'm not generally into blocking people on social media because I don't want to slowly get into a position where I start blocking people with slightly different views than me. That kind of power can be misused, and the more you use it. But this guy, but had this guy not blocked me, I wouldn't have blocked him and reported him on Twitter. The guy was clearly deranged if he doesn't mind causing harm to others. 
He's the kind of guy who'd randomly stab you if you walk past him on the street because he knew you weren't in the same political spectrum as him. My point in all of this, when I think of what people like Marina Sirtis and Alex Kurtzman are doing with the Star Trek name, this is who they're making Star Trek for. These people are their audience today, and it doesn't take a genius to see that's not a good thing. Anyway, what would I know? According to the people on Twitter, I'm supposed to be out of touch with Star Trek. Apologies, Rob, for the rather grim letter, but this is a letter I've needed to send you for a while. Let's not use our authority and fame to divide fandom. Kind regards, Pedro. P.S. I sent some questions to you via your email regarding the short story competition. If you could answer these questions, that would be great. Oh, I, I keep hearing that. You've sent that to me, and I'll look into that. Uh, you know what? This is a very interesting letter. And, um, Pedro, I... Uh, I pretty much agree with you. I'll tell you something, and this this might seem strange coming from me. I am not a fan of Donald Trump. I will say that right off the bat. There are a lot of reasons for that, but I'm not a fan of his. And I have put things up and said, indeed, that I will be voting, actually, I've already voted, for Joe Biden as President of the United States, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. However... Donald Trump is the president of the United States. Uh, The Electoral College, maybe he didn't win the popular vote, but he did win the Electoral College vote, and that is how our country is set up. And I tend to agree with you. I think that if you are an actor, look, nowadays we live in a world where if you are an actor and you do something questionable in your private life, for instance, I don't know, choke out a fan or it fi- you find somebody finds out you wore blackface 10 years ago or one of these things, you're out. You get fired from the show that you worked on. Now, I agree with you. I, I think that Star Trek as an entity has uh, existed for 54 years because for the most part, it was all inclusive. And... Uh, I I think you're absolutely right when you have the cast of Star Trek. Look, I understand that most people that work in entertainment, I am, I consider myself a classical liberal, but lean to the left. I understand that. And I believe that most people that work in the arts also prize intelligence and cogent thought. Uh, I, I, I believe in that. But when you have an entire franchise like Star Trek, and the cast and the, and the franchise itself and the people that make it, when they are representing a certain political view, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Because I think that the basic human truths, here's how I've always viewed it, Star Trek is dealing with the human truths that are move beyond politics. They're non, like you said, not partisan. And I think that if you were to watch an episode, I keep going back to the drumhead. And if you want to see, if you want to see um, a great piece of writing and a great piece of acting, look up Picard's speech from the drumhead. Uh, it's an episode of Next Generation that's great. I don't think that any American, whether they're left, they're on the left, or they're on the right, or they're a centrist, or they vote for Trump, or they vote for Biden, I don't think that there's any American that would watch that clip from the drumhead and have a, uh, they wouldn't agree with it. Maybe some would, I guess. But I think for the most part, you are correct. Star Trek has been about dealing with human truths that are usually beyond partisan politics. And I do not like to see the way Star Trek has been politicized. Because I think, like you pointed out, that's not very fair. I've always loved Star Trek because I thought it did transcend, mostly for the most part, it did transcend politics and varying political views, and it spoke to the universality of what it's like to be a human being. And I think that's really part of the problem now, is that Star Trek has been overtly politicized to one side. And it's, I think it's, uh, uh, that's happened a lot. And, and a, it, 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 it signifies a shift over to a certain... Now, again, I have my own political leadings that are, 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 I disagree with how I think the country has been governed 
over the last four years. And I think the anti-science, anti-intellectual, anti-press bias that we have seen from our administration is dangerous. And I think that you can do Star Trek stories about demagoguery that are universal stories. But I have to agree with you, Pedro. I I think you're absolutely right in, in showing all this. Now, Marina Sirtis is somebody who was on Star Trek and is on Star Trek now. And I think that Star Trek is a is a, a, an interesting case, but I do think when actors, um, same thing was true of you know Marvel actors and things like that. And I get it, I get where that's coming from. But when the franchise itself becomes at the forefront of you're you're saying Star Trek presents, and then it becomes political, I think that's definitely problematic. I think seeing Star Trek choose a political side is problematic because one of Star Trek's strengths is, in fact, its universality. And I can't believe I'm saying that, but I do believe it. And one of the things that has bothered me about uh, about modern Star Trek is it, it, it is both left-leaning and intellectually stupid, which to me is, uh, those are diametrically opposed things to me. I mean, they can talk about how woke it is all they want. Then why are you writing such fucking stupid scripts? You know, you know, you know what being woke is to me? Being really smart. You know, being woke is being able to listen to everybody's ideas, to be able to sit in a room and listen to opposing ideas that you from people you might hate. But if you're really woke, you listen to those ideas, just like you listen to the ideas that people that you agree with have. If you're not willing to listen to the opposition, you're not woke. You're a fascist. You're an intellectually dishonest person. And that's what I can't stand. I, I, I think that one of the things about what we have to do lead, moving forward and one of the things about Star Trek that's so important to me is Star Trek has always opened my mind. I've always been like, huh. Because I think the basic human truths transcend. I really believe in those things. I mean, growing up and watching Star Trek, you know, they were always talking about all of us. You know, what does it mean to be a human being on this planet? We might have our petty differences, but in the long run, what does it mean? You know, what does it mean to be human? And I think the greatest stories are the stories that find those human truths about all of us. You know, whether it's Star Trek, whether it's science fiction, whether it's drama of any kind, whether you're reading a romance novel or all the great art is talking about those really deep amazing human truths that sort of transcend our petty differences. And I think Star Trek should be that way as well. I know people are probably finding that to be, uh, 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 that I'm, will, I'll be accused of, oh, Rob, you're turning into some kind of a conservative. I don't think so. I'm a classical liberal. And um, I think that was a good letter, Pedro. And thanks for writing it in. Let's see what uh, you guys are saying over here. I know a lot of people have been firing things in. Let's see what you're firing in. Um uh, um, let's see, uh, Emil Johansson said, what if the trolley hitting one person hits a baby or a big politician and the 10 people are criminals? Oh, I already read that. I read that the other day. Uh, well, and the 10 people are criminals. Is it good to choose the bigger number? I don't know quite what that was referring to. I missed that. So I'm sure it was back when we were talking about something. Sorry, Emil. I apologize. Uh, Stubble McShave sends in a tip and he says so i spent over three hours yesterday theorizing and speculating on youtube and social media just because a 16 second long audio file was released by the wheel of time prime for the upcoming wheel of time series i've missed all the speculation we did between book releases so what stubble mcshave is saying now i i, I know for a fact that there is not a person on this planet more excited for the upcoming Wheel of Time television series than our own Stubble McShave in Sweden. I mean, you've seen his videos over the past two years. He's shown us his collections. He never misses a moment to talk about the Wheel of Time series. Well, for those of you who don't know, they released an audio clip, just an audio clip from the Wheel of Time show. And so what Stubble McShave, McShave is saying, what Stubble's saying, so I spent over three hours yesterday theorizing and speculating on YouTube and social media. Because of that 16-second uh, uh, clip, he says that he's missed 
all the speculation we did between book releases. You know, one of the great things about being a fan, being part of the post-geek singularity and being an imagination connoisseur is all the talk, all that speculation. Come on, how much fun do you have? We would get into... I, I remember I remember when after uh, after Star Wars came out, you know, and after Empire came out, there was a lot, every science fiction magazine would speculate on what's next, what's going to happen, what's going on. And I don't think anyone likes to speculate about things more than science fiction, fantasy, and horror film fans, imagination connoisseurs. So Stubble, I um, I um, I feel you, man. You must be having a great time. I'm I'm happy for you. I'm happy that there's you know it's like I said, we live in wondrous times, man. I bet Stubble, if somebody said to you, you know, they're going to make a Wheel of Time TV series three years ago, you would have been like, eh, I don't know. Now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. Let's hope it lasts more than one season like the Dark Crystal reboot did because I quite like that. And there it goes. But isn't it great we live in that world? Uh, What'sitgear.com sends me a tip and says, Hey, Rob, about two weeks ago I sent Mike an email about possibly advertising on your show. Is there a better way for me to get in touch with you? Um, you you can always send me uh, an email at robertmeyerburnett at ludovicotechnique.net. Robert Meyer Burnett at LudovicoTechnique.net if you want. Um, but that's not that uh, you. I, I have to like your product. Um, Willow Willow sends in a tip and says, "Come on, Rob, don't distort the facts. They didn't know how to revert Tuvix at first, so he was alive for weeks, not seconds, as you claimed. I didn't mean to say he was there for seconds. So what Willow is referring to, Willow Yang, our resident, our most perhaps our most beloved member of the Post Geek Singularity community. Willow Yang, loved by all. She's probably going to create some disease in a lab once that, you know, is uh, going to eliminate half of mankind. No, I'm just kidding, Willow. You're going to save half of mankind, and, depending on how you look at it. But anyway, she's not going to go I am legend on all of us. She's our favorite microbiologist, our favorite PhD candidate. Willow Yang wrote a great letter in the other day about Tuvix from the episode of the same name of Star Trek Voyager when uh, Neelix and Tuvok were, 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 because of an accident, transformed into Tuvix. And what are the ethical ramifications of that? Should they have killed Tuvix at the end of the episode to get Neelix and Tuvok back or let Tuvix live? I, I realized that was a miss. I misspoke. I didn't mean to say he was there for seconds. I mean, yes, he was. they got to know him. I mean, the, the whole point of that episode was he was a being. He was somebody that had a personality, and, and, and you, you liked him. You liked Tuvix. So I didn't mean to say that. Um, I didn't mean to distort the facts, Willow. But still, I think ethically it's it's a difficult it's a difficult situation. I've been thinking about that a lot, actually. I can't believe you've made me think about a Voyager episode for longer than a few hours, but you have. I keep coming back to the conundrum. Do we allow Tuvix to live, saving the lives of Neelix and Tuvok, or not? I have to say, I, I still lean in on saving Neelix and Tuvok because they're your, they're your they're your your shipmates and compatriots, and if there's a way to save them, you would. And Tuvix is a is is the result of an accident. I mean, if you're in an accident and you break a leg, you set the leg and fix it. You know, if somebody is wounded, you you get them fixed. You don't allow them to be wounded. I know I know this accident created a new life form, but the problem is that life form is the result. And again, I know you say it's a result of an accident. Well, what about babies that were accidents? I know it's tough, but I still think I, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to save Neelix and Tuvok. I really am. Willow goes on to say, <laughs> if you met a humanoid alien who looks and acts like a grown adult woman, but is actually only two and her species only live for eight or nine years, will you be able to have a relationship with her? Or you would you find it too weird? Well, first of all, okay. The question that I would ask you, if, if, if there was an alien species that only lived for eight or nine of our years, what would the equivalent of her be if she was only two? Would I have a... If she, so she's been alive for two years... I mean, if I was going to have a relationship with her, you know, it's like when um, Riker met met uh, Torin, uh, 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 or no, Soren uh, of the Janai in the Outcast. It would have to. It would really depend on on how um, how we got along. And if you're asking about a relationship, like I would, I would assume you're meaning a physical relationship. Um, you know, for me, it, it's it's like I. It depends. I mean. I've always thought that physical, 
the best kinds of physical interaction you can have with people is when both of you are bringing something to the party. I've never been one of that one of those dudes that looks at a pretty girl and just wants to lay pipe because she's pretty and turns me on. I don't like that. I mean, you want to be with somebody where it's a give and take, and that you you both can uh, you both find each other delicious and and pleasuring one another is 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 something that uh, it, it's it's equally satisfying for both people. And that's that's I find I find women that have their own sexual desires and needs and wants to be. And, and things they like to do to you to be the sexiest kind of women. So I don't know if it would be her age. I would have to want to know like how mature she was, you know, if, if, if she was only two years old, obviously. And, and, and if she's only living to be nine, is that, is it like, is being two years old, like dog years? So what you'd be 14. See, to me, that would be kind of too young. I mean, at my age right now, I'd probably want to hook up with, uh, someone who is five years from that species or four years, maybe three years, depending on how far back you go. But, you know, again, the things that appealed to me in that way, like when I was younger, I liked older women. When I was, uh, when I was 22 years old, I dated a 28 year old and a 40 year old. It was fun. <laughs> I, I never really liked going back the other way, <laughs> so, to be honest. Um, so it would, it would depend. I mean, it would depend. You know, I, I would have to know how that civilization worked. Uh, Stubble McShave goes on to say, uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of hypocrisy in the Star Trek fan film guidelines when it says that you can't use profanity in Star Trek fan films. How many four-letter words are there in modern Star Trek? Answer, a lot more than there should be. Look, I agree. They tell you you, you make a Star Trek fan film and you can't swear, yet on Star Trek... I mean, they use profanity all the time. And what's so interesting to me is is you'd think that they would Star Trek would make up its own profanity. You know, when I started, when Data said, oh shit, in Generations, um, and, and also when Kirk was struggling to use profanity in Star Trek IV, colorful metaphors, well, double dumbass on you. You know, it was it was interesting to me because you'd think that, like if, you know what what's funny to me is that you know when you hear prof i used to be married to to a uh to a ukrainian a russian woman she's ukrainian but you know the first thing you do when you meet women that speak foreign languages is you're like teach me how to swear married you know teach me how to swear in a foreign language but it's funny because you say you say those words here nobody understands what you're saying um and I, I've always thought that if you're going to have swear words in, in if like I liked in Battlestar Galactica when they said, they say frack, we all know what it means, but it's kind of neat. Frack off. You know, you can, frack sounds kind of dumb. Well, frack. But if you say it right, like frack you, man, it can work. But yeah, it's weird. It's Star Trek using profa profanity. It's such a lazy, again, so lazy and dumb. Like, wh why do you have to do that? Like, why do you have to use bad language? You know, if there was bad language in Star Trek when I was four, five, six, seven, eight, I don't think my parents, if my parents heard fucking shit in Star Trek when I was a kid, they wouldn't have let me watch it. So, uh, Stubble McShave goes on to say, Amazon started up here in Sweden. The auto translation hit a snag with some products. A postcard depicting a huge rooster was called a massive cock on the site. Well, theoretically, I guess that's what it is. And all things related to rapeseed oil was translated from a really bad version of that word. <laughs> I didn't even know there was rapeseed oil. Um, wow. Damo Davies is here. Greetings from the UK. So it's really come to this? Yes, Rob, I need an answer. Which Q do you prefer? Star Trek's Q or James Bond's Q? And which would you prefer to hang out with? Okay, that's such demo. That's unfair. I mean, come on, Desmond Llewellyn. How can you not want to hang out with him, and all of the and all the things he would give you, all the gadgets? But if you're asking me to choose between my quartermaster and Q from the Q Continuum, uh, the quartermaster is going to bitch and moan and complaining, playing all the time. Grow up, 007. Grow up, Burnett. However, Q Q would want to. If you told Q that you wanted to, you know go to uh, Vegas and pull a Fredo, I think Q would be with you on that. I don't think Desmond Llewellyn would be. So uh, 
I think I would take Q, and plus Q could take you around the universe. Like if you th- Q would be like, if you think Vegas is fun, let's go here, and he'd take you to some amazing planet. Uh, I would want to do that. Uh, Damo Davies goes on to say, Tasha Yar was at a job interview recently. They ask her whether she's had any data entry skills. How would you recommend she answer, or should she be should she diplomatically decline? Um, I I think she should answer very cheekily, and say, uh, I have deep knowledge of data entry skills. <laughs> That's how I would answer. <laughs> so there you go. Emil Johansson goes on and says, if Charlie Chaplin made his speech today, would people accuse him of being a Hollywood liberal lefty with an agenda? <laughs> What Emil Johansson is referring to is the great dictator speech. It's one of the great speeches. You know what? Let's find that speech and let's put it in the live chat. Uh, speech. Uh, this is one of the greatest speeches ever in, in cinema history. And um, um, let's see if they put that. Actually, it's on the Charlie Chaplin website. Yeah, here it is. And I'm going to get it for y'all, all y'all right now. If you haven't seen this speech, you need to watch this speech. I'm putting it in the live chat right now. Check it out. It's one of the great, uh, it's one of the great speeches ever, uh, ever manufactured in cinema history. Wait, did I get it in there? I can't, uh, I can't tell. Yes, everybody should watch it. <clears throat> So there you go. Um, hey, Julius Goodwin is here. Julius, thank you so much for the support. I just want to say good afternoon and let you know I hadn't forgotten about you guys. It's been something of a hectic time lately, but I'm trying my best to be around. Just curious, have you read DC's Three Jokers storyline? I admit I'm impressed. I have not, but the Three Jokers, I will get it when it's in hardcover. You know, I don't buy single issues anymore, but I can't wait to read that storyline. Everyone has told me how good it is. I really can't wait uh, to see it. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can't wait. I'm, I'm very excited to read three jokers. Jeff Johns wrote it. The art looks incredible. I can't wait. So Julius, I have not seen it, but I will get the hardcover when it comes out. I assume it will come out. I mean, I'm, you know what? I might not have liked doomsday clock very much, but I liked Jeff Johns's work. I liked teen Titans. I liked his green lantern work quite a bit. I mean, I've got a lot of Jeff Johns on the on the shelf here, the dark side war. Yeah, I, I, I dig it. So I, I will totally get it. Uh, Ashley says, hi, Rob. Have you seen the trailer for the upcoming Michael Bay produced songbird movie? It's the kind of movie. Is this kind of movie a little too soon considering we're still in the midst of the global pandemic? Thanks Rob for all that you do. I have not seen that trailer. I knew they were making that movie. I don't know. Did it just drop? Um, I'd love to watch it and talk about it. Um, yeah. Huh. Um, Ensign Tilly sends in a tip and says, okay, we get it. You're smart. Everybody here is smart. <laughs> Except Ensign Tilly. I wish she could act like she was an actual Starfleet officer. Um, but she never does. Ensign Tilly, do better. Come on, man. Um, Joe Dick sends in a super chat. Joe Dick says, Star Wars. Was it revealed what Han was smuggling? He had to dump his cargo in space? He could have been smuggling slaves for Jabba's brothels. Shooting first could be the least of his crimes. Well, Joe Dick, uh, I, I, I don't think Han Solo was smuggling slaves. Uh, I thought he had spice shipments. I don't know what it was he dropped. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but that's a very funny thing to understand. I don't think that Han Solo was the kind of guy that would dump slaves into the vacuum of space. I don't think he would. Uh, Stubble McShave says, concerning... Paul from Long Beach's Sandwich Challenge. I submit our Swedish sandwich cake and claim victory. Here is an example of it. Well, Stubble McShave, allow me to put... Now remember, um, this is this is an example. Stubble McShave calls this uh, it is a Swedish sandwich cake. And I'm putting this into the live chat. You can all click on it. I don't know what that is, but um, okay. Uh, Joseph is here. Joseph says, oh, hi, Rob. I'm guessing you hated the latest episode of Disco. Um, well, you heard me at the beginning. I ranted. Not as much, though. Uh, 
I want to hear your rant, though. Although, you got to admit, at least they didn't move Starfleet Academy from near the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, no, it looked great. Earth looked great. Why didn't they, like, why are, first of all, why are they in such a hurry to to go and find the, it, it's, it's like, you guys have jumped a thousand years into the future. You don't know shit about the future. Michael Burnham has been running around. Why don't you go on a fact? I know that's not exciting, but why don't you go on a fact-finding mission? You don't even know what you're doing. They go to Earth. You'd think that they would upload every database that there is and 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 tell us something about the future, uh, but they don't. I don't think anyone even stopped to think about that. God, I hate the writing on that show. Uh, Jamie Cruz is here. Um, <laughs> Jamie Cruz says, Rob, 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 you had to talk about the QMX Star Trek figures on Inglorious Trexperts, didn't you? Not sure how I missed them on eBay, but thank you. Yeah, the new I didn't pick up the new versions of Kirk and Spock, and I needed to, and they're expensive now. Um, <laughs> yeah, the QMX Star Trek figures are great. Love them. They're 12-inch figures. I think they're the best 12-inch Star Trek figures that have ever been done. So, Jamie, don't 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 shoot the messenger, son. Uh, Calvin's here. Hello, Calvin Bowes. Uh, John Wayne, who is a hard conservative, even said, you must listen to both sides before getting an opinion. Yeah, and of course, now John Wayne's going to be canceled. I mean, we have forgotten political discourse. The entire way our civilization works is you must hear people's sides of the story. You have to, and then weigh them and be able to debate them. We've lost that ability in this country. You know, we're, we're branding people based on their political ideas. We're not listening. The whole purpose of this entire channel is to listen to other people. Not just people I necessarily agree with. If people want to take me to task, I read their letters. You've heard me do it. And uh, absolutely, we must listen to other people. Um, Anonymous sends in a tip and says, with all the surprise comic book characters now reprising their roles in newer iterations, I think it would be an ideal time to bring back Sam Rockwell as Justin Hammer. I didn't care for him in Iron Man 2, but a more menacing evolved version would be a treat. I like, you know what? I like Iron Man 2 a lot more than other people do, but I think it's, I think it's, you're right, Anonymous. I think it's a really good idea. Like, why not? Um, why not? Um, Yeah. Um, Jason S. Oh, wait, Regis K is next. Regis K says, hi, Rob, which captain would you prefer to serve under Pike, Kirk, Picard, Cisco, or Janeway? Well, Regis K, there's only one answer for that. <laughs> for me, that would be James Tiberius Kirk. Um, I think he'd be the most fun and you'd have the most interesting term of duty, term of service, term of duty. Uh, Jason S. says, I think the last four years would have been a lot better if Trump didn't have to sit on a drumhead for four years while conspiracy theorists went around falsely accusing Trump and everyone they didn't like as being Russian agents. Well, you might have you might have a point there, but, um, you know, we found out a lot of things about Trump. Let, let's just take one example. How much taxpayer money he spent going to his own golf club. I mean, that alone, we've never had really a president that owned his own golf club that used as much taxpayer money as Donald Trump has done going to his golf club. You know what? Uh, my my one objection, my biggest objection to Donald Trump that I, that I have to say is that he has shown very little interest in the office itself. Um, I, I have not seen uh, any, um, you know, he's president of the United States, and I would have thought that for four years he would have been more interested in uh, the office of the presidency. And he, he didn't staff. There's half of, half of the government positions that he could have staffed, he did not staff, he his, uh, which is surprising. And I have not seen a lot of... Uh, that's if, if, for, if nothing else, uh, the fact that you get into the presidency, it would have been nice to have seen him grow into the presidency and become... He's never been a president that's been interested in governing the entire country. And and it it is it, it it's that's the thing that's bummed me out. He's remained partisan, he's remained divisive, and he wasn't even a Republican really until he became president of the United States. So for me, if nothing else, that's what was disappointing. It was disappointing to see a president that was not interested in governing everyone in this country, but only certain people in this country. 
And I, I don't think that you can argue that. Um, I think it's pretty self-evident. A anything else, you know, I, I, I don't think I, I try and stay on a tr fairly politically neutral on this show. But I can say that that for somebody who became president of the United States, it's I, I mean, the, the accusations against other people, whether it's fake news, fake Democrats, whatever. I, I've seen no that alone. That's my biggest criticism um, in accepting the office of president. He did not accept the office for everyone. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily debatable. I think that you would have to agree that with that. And regardless of why that is, um, I think that, and there, there, the, that's, I think the president needs, on the other hand, I would say that it is once the president of the United States is elected for whatever reason, once we accept the result of the election, I think it's also better if we as a nation can tend to get behind our president and the administration to be helpful. I mean, partisan politics has become so bad in, in Washington, D.C. that we're not getting, we don't, we don't have a functional federal government. And I think the, the pandemic crisis has proven that. You know, during a, a pandemic would be the one time that I would think that the government would, would come together and everybody would, would agree on a course of action since it's based in uh, science and and previous knowledge from existing pandemics that we've already been through, but that wasn't the case, and that's what's been most disappointing to me, is is that. Uh, Jeff Yerke sends in a super chat. Hello, Jeff. Jeff, no mention of your wife. Well, let me say, uh, Mrs. Y, the Yerksters. Uh, I would like to give out a, a hearty shout out to your wife. I hope all is well with her. You're always you're always. It's kind of romantic. You always talk about. Shout out from uh, Mrs. Yerke herself. Well, let me just give her a shout out. And thank you, sir, for supporting the channel. Uh, I got so many more letters. I mean, I could stay on for a long time. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, William La Rochelle writes a very funny letter in. After listening to episode 539 about Shatner and CBS, I found myself deciding... It was time to put on Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. One positive to come from CBS All Access is that it makes this much maligned feature play far better than I'd remembered. I didn't notice anything wrong with the directing, and overall I found it quite entertaining. I might wonder about whether any version of the Enterprise would be in a state of technical disarray. Maybe too much was made of things not working, since Starfleet might not even want Scotty on board at all until it was ready. But overall, I expect the film suffers from context and the fact that it was not Wrath of Khan or The Voyage Home, in the sense that Return of the Jedi was not The Empire Strikes Back. But even Jedi is fun to watch today, if I can find it without Jedi Rocks or the young Anakin ghost. I have it. Uh, I have to say that the comfort food element is certainly there in The Final Frontier, whereas the Kirkman Trek is has I I wouldn't I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to live there factor. When you talk about fan made stuff, I first thought of Anna, that Star Wars girl. I'm impressed that she has been able to sell her artwork despite being so outspoken about the last Star Wars trilogy. I may have mentioned that from the mid-90s to the 2000s, I'd written a screenplay adaptation of Dune, years before the Sci-Fi Channel version, Piers Anthony's On a Pale Horse, Brian Daly's Han Solo at Star's End, and a combined adaptation of The Name Above the Title by Frank Capra and The Catastrophe of Success by Joseph McBride. Wow. <laughs> well, you, you don't have any lack of ambition. In each case, I just felt compelled to go ahead. Steve Tisch adapted the world according to Garp without having been hired or having the rights, but admittedly he already had a track record. Sofia Coppola adapted The Virgin Suicides without the screenplay rights to that, but these precedents don't help the rest of us. I did naively write to Lucasfilm about the Han Solo thing and got a letter back from the legal department. <laughs> Piers Anthony advised me when the rights were available, his agent contact, and then told me when Disney had the option to the Incarnations of Immortality books. In the end, the exercise of writing anything can be classified as sharpening the blade, much like the habit of debating unresolved issues. I have kept up a green screen and I have kept a large Millennium Falcon wrapped in a closet since 2012, and having the wind taken out of my sails about filling the void of Star Wars, Star Wars at the time, I did some storyboarding and might still shoot the opening scene with action figures, but I don't know. I realize that even if I were to set a film in my own apartment at any stage of life, there would be legal consequences. 
Could I have had Star Wars wallpaper in the background without express written permission? Uh, no, you can't. Is there something to be said for spending some time creating art that is not feeding off of someone else, someone else's corporate machine? Well, you know, there's been a lot of people that criticized the Axonar project, for instance, for stealing Star Trek IP. Star Wars, like Star Trek, has a long history of people making fan films about it. My good friend Kevin Rubio, who I'm working uh, once again on a project with now, he made Troops, where he took two properties. He took Cops and Star Wars and put them together in the Troops film. Now, the thing about that is it could always be defended under fair use because it was parody. However, one of the great things about what Kevin did is even though it was a parody of, of the form of Cops, it was a legitimate Star Wars story. And it worked within canon, just like his Tag and Bink comics did, which I thought was really clever. I mean, yeah, it was a humorous bent, but it was still pretty funny. If you guys haven't seen Troops, it's pretty amazing stuff. So I would say check it out. Um, but then with, with Axanar, look, we were trying to do the fan film on another level. We were trying to apply our biggest mistake. Well, we made two big mistakes. Our, 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 our biggest mistake was that after making all the money that we made, we didn't just shut up, go silent, and make the films. That was a big mistake. The second mistake was... Um, that we kept talking about it. We made ourselves very high profile. We turned ourselves into targets. I mean, I would say, and that's for me. I think the biggest mistake was that all the money that was taken in was not put into an escrow account and overseen by a production accountant, which is what it should have been done. I had no control over the money, and it became someone's personal piggy bank more than anything else. So, there you go. Um, but in terms of making... You know, small student films. I think if you made a Star Wars, if you made a feature length movie out of Star Wars action figures and just put it up on YouTube for free, I don't think you'd have a problem. I think people would have, uh, I think people would have liked it. You know, um, uh, I, 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 I think you should do it. If you made, uh, if you made it, I would watch that. Who wouldn't watch that? Uh, because you could technically say that, okay, I've made, um, I have made, uh, I, I think that if anybody makes a movie out of action figures, it would be considered fair use because it's transformative and nobody would, nobody would ever mistake that what you've done is competing with the Star Wars franchise at all. Um, but I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, so there you go. Uh, a nice letter, though. A good letter. Um, <laughs> Nick Markins sends in a super chat and says, What did you think of David Cronenberg's cameo in Jason X? He played, what's the guy's name? Uh, Aloysius? Dr. Aloysius? Oh, God, what was his name? Uh, Dr. Wishes, Aloysius Wimmer? Was it Bartholomew? I don't remember. Aloysius, though. <laughs> I love that name, Aloysius Wimmer, I think. I mean, you know, David Cronenberg, he always shows up in crazy places. Obviously, he was in Clive Barker's Nightbreed. One of my favorite David Cronenberg, uh, he was in Into the Night. Was it Into the Night? The John, John Lance movie, Into the Night? And then one of my favorite cameos that Cronenberg ever did was in the Canadian film Last Night. That is about the humanity's last night on Earth. And he plays a... Um, the employee of the power company who's calling every single person that gets power, like it's like there's a hundred, three hundred, how many hundreds of thousands of people? And he's calling all of them and thanking them for their business. But I'm in, man. I'm in. Aloysius. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So there you go. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty funny. That's a pretty funny question. Uh, Nick uh, goes on to say. Have you ever seen a movie called The Last Starfighter? What? Oh, I just got the new Arrow Blu-ray and I've never seen it before. I, too, got the new Arrow Blu-ray. So you are going to find out who Zur and the Kodan Armada are. Yes, I saw The Last Starfighter opening weekend when it first opened in 1984. Um, the one thing you're going to, you're going to, that, that might, um, The Last Starfighter was famously the first movie that all of its space effects were done in CGI. 
that's what it's it's known for. But the the gun star in the last Starfighter is one cool spaceship. Um, and you'll Robert Preston's great. You're gonna like it. The last Starfighter's great. It's great. So Nick, uh, report back because I think you, sir, are going to have a pretty damn fun time. And Arrow does a fine job. As a matter of fact, I believe my Arrow. I would imagine it got delayed, but I think my Arrow disc is on my front porch right now. Shh, don't don't come over here and steal it. Um, but I think I do believe that it is there. Um, let's see. Uh, what do we got here? Um, Phil writes... Salut, Rob, Roberto. So this week's acquisition of the Charlie Brown and Peanuts franchise by Apple left me shaking my head and kind of sad. Then on Rob's Observations 542, your comments on the possible sale of the next Bond film No Time to Die to Apple Plus, as well as your astute remarks on the possible buyout of the Bond franchise as a whole, left me a bit shocked. I know that with the new streaming wars, sales of valuable IPs like this will likely become very common, but I, as a consumer, feel deeply concerned. Now, I know from a common sense business perspective, this might be viewed as a shrewd move, but once again, the consumer, the imagination connoisseur, is left out to dry in these decisions. As more and more content is being siloed into separate entities, we will now be required to subscribe to an endless series of services to be able to enjoy our favorite content. Although this might not be an issue yet, if companies like Apple, Netflix, and others start paying huge amounts of money for IPs, the subscription prices will most certainly go up considerably, probably sooner than later. As I reported on today, Netflix going up, but only by a couple of bucks so far. I don't know about anyone else, but as a cord cutter, this leaves me with a conundrum. Will I be drawn into paying the same and maybe even more money for all my streaming services than I used to with cable? Or will I start cherry-picking content, leaving some beloved franchises behind in the hopes of catching it months later, maybe on some other service after its first run, or on physical media? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we had free TV. Then came cable, and we started paying a lot to get more content. Eventually, we basically paid to watch 20 minutes of commercials an hour. That's true. Then came streaming with more and more content choices. Now I see the lines between theatrical streaming and television content getting blurred, and I fear the most for the theater industry. It's been left in shambles by the pandemic, and with studios bleeding money on hugely expensive films that will never make their money back, we're now talking about companies paying billions to secure IPs into their services. I understand companies are trying to recoup some losses, but it almost feels like we're trading in a problem and creating a whole new one for the future. I don't disagree with you. Is this viable for the companies, or is this a case of we'll deal with the problem later approach? What will this do to the theater industry in the next couple of years if studios start thinking in strictly in terms of their IPs? And what about the consumer, the imagination connoisseur? In any case, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this. Big greetings from Montreal, and everyone stay safe. And that comes from Phil. Phil, very good questions. Well, one of the things I see happening is that, you know, everyone seems to be shunting the burden off to the consumer. Uh, and I think, boy, you know, the let's call it the middle class, let's call it consumers. It's as if all of our expendable income uh, has stayed the same, even though we're in the middle of a global pandemic and tens of millions are out of work. And uh, it's crazy to me that everybody just expects it, 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 you know, the very fabric of society with all of our wealth, so much of our wealth being held by a very small amount of individuals, the, the society that they've made that wealth in, if, if it's not healthy, if the underpinnings of the society aren't health, healthy, everything is going to collapse. Even the people at the top are going to feel their uh, livelihood falling apart. So it's important for the infrastructure of society, I think, to be to be bolstered whenever it can be. And the Hollywood industry, the, the entire entertainment industry has taken a major hit uh, on a number of different levels. And it's not just streaming services and things like that. I mean, the theatrical industry, let's face it, the, the going to the movies, even during the Great Depression, Going to the movies was a huge thing. People went to the movies during the Great Depression because whatever mo money they could scrounge up, you know, you have a nickel or whatever, a dime, you can go to the theater and see movies and sit there all day. Well, now with this global pandemic, 
decimating the economy and destroying the movie industry. You can't even do that. And I do think that, um, you know, that we've talked about this a lot on the John Campy show. It's not just movie theaters. It's all the surrounding businesses. Usually there's a lot of multiplexes that are around malls, that are around restaurants. So it's a whole ecosystem that's been destroyed, not just going to the movies. And then all the support things that go into movies, whether it's soda or drinks or snacks or refreshments or candy, whatever, all of those businesses have taken a hit as well. Um, and then the movie theater chains are, are, they need movies to be in their theater chains. And of course the studios had spent a lot of money. I mean, the whole thing is, it's in a shambles. Like I've said before, I feel like we were all on some big giant sailing ship, like maybe that Columbus or the Pilgrims took across the 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 ocean and it hit some rocky shoal and we've been capsized or we've run aground and now we're standing around thinking well this this boat is never going to be seaworthy again what are we going to do now so i don't know it's uh it's tough but i i think look yes as you put it things are going to get siloed because these streaming services are only as good as their programming now i think apple plus they don't have a lot to start with. They're looking for things. But Apple Plus is going to be unique because in five or ten years, their programming, assuming they they hit they hit on all, uh, all cylinders, they're going to end up making some great programming that's going to be a perennial favorite for people. They'll pe- people will keep coming back to it. And people will know. See, the thing about streaming services is you can jump in and out of them now. At least, I think they're going to figure out a way to curtail that. that they're going to say you have to sign up for a year as opposed to signing up and then being able to cancel whenever you want, jumping in and out. I think that the next thing that's going to go is that people are going to say, no, you have to sign up for a year. You have to sign up for a year because they're going to need that income. And I think with streaming services now, you can jump in and out of them. But but in terms of having, re- remember, like movies themselves have been siloed in the sense that they're owned by the companies that made them. And there weren't that many movie studios. So like MGM had the Bond franchise until Columbia released, uh, was it Casino Royale and Quantum? I don't know what their output deal was, but but that's always been the case. You know, the different home video companies that were owned by the studios, whether it was Fox, Warner Brothers, New Line, Disney, they all put out their own movies. So all their content was siloed with them. It's just that what's happening now is that like Fox doesn't exist anymore and Disney owns it. So there's less places where these properties and movies can be siloed which means they can charge more money, which has always been the case. But at the end of the day, we need that money uh, to make product. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I mean, I think, you know, again, how many streaming services, if you wind up with 30 different streaming services, it gets just as expensive as cable and people that won't sustain. So I think people have to figure out how those things are all going to work. And I don't know how they are going to work. I think we're going to we're watching an evolution right now. We're in the middle of a, a massive sea change. The pandemic has accelerated the idea, the shift, the move toward. Look, I believe that the demise of the movie theater, aside from being very spectacle driven, like IMAX versions of event films, I think people will go see them. Um, but they've got to do something. I want I want them to save the movie going experience because right now streaming and PVOD cannot cannot sustain a 250 million dollar movie you can no law 250 million dollar movie must gross a billion dollars and if it can't and it doesn't look like that's going to be the case i mean we lost a thousand souls today from covid in the united states alone we got they closed movie theaters um in france and or in germany and they're doing it in france as well so we're going right back into lockdown and it's our own fault you know, we could have done a better job of, I mean, our, I know our economy couldn't handle it, but we should have figured out a way. You know, it should have been an all hands on deck scenario and it wasn't. And now we're suffering, but it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out in the end. I mean, I have faith too that, you know, eventually you're just going to buy what you want. People are going to be much more discerning. They're going to be like, okay, I only spent this much time on Amazon or I only spent this much time on Netflix. Maybe, maybe I'll wait because you know if you could jump in and have it for three months, you binge everything you want to see on that platform until they fill it back up, they fill your tank back up, and you can watch some more, like Ecstasy. <laughs> no, <I'm> just kidding, <laughs> sort of. Um, yeah. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. 
let's see. Um, uh, Mr. Burnett, I see you have a fondness for physical media. Would you be interested in two DVDs of feature films I produced? One is called Veil of Blood, inspired by the original Evil Dead, about a mob hit that awakens a golem that goes on a rampage killing Nazi gangsters on Cape Cod. Come on, man. <laughs> Who wouldn't love that? It has over two hours of extra features. It also took me six years to complete. When we had the premiere at Coolidge Corner Theater in Brookline, Massachusetts, there were protesters picketing against my film, mainly because I hired them. The other is a black and white melodramatic romantic comedy called The Stoop, inspired by the films of Billy Wilder and the French New Wave. Shot in downtown Boston with no permits, it features Kay Hanley from Letters to Cleo on the soundtrack. It comes in a tin collector's case. I've been learning about getting involved in making movies since 1994. I blame it all on seeing Star Wars back in 97, or in 77. I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels that movie forever changed our lives. This past February, I formed Dream Apex Pictures, LLC, and I'm currently producing an adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's story called Celepheus, and a creature feature show for a new streaming service called The Other Side of Midnight with hostess Ursula Grimsworth and her puppet co-hosts, Wilton and Wilmouse. <laughs> Joe, send it on. Keep up the great work, Rob. Your show inspires me to always listen to my heart, stay humble, pay it forward, and never give up. And never surrender, Joe. Send it on. There's a, there's a. You can send it to me uh, on our website. There's a PO box. So please do. Congratulations on keeping on, keeping on, keeping on making stuff. Um, I think that's very, very cool. Um, let's see. Steve Gerard has written in. Rob, after the impressive Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back, I agree with your review of Return of the Jedi. I have a simple question regarding the second Death Star. Did they ever state on screen in Return of the Jedi that the second Death Star was much bigger than the first? No, they did not. When I saw Return of the Jedi years, later, years ago, I thought that this was a revised design, but it's exactly the same design. How to resolve this? In the scene aboard the Imperial shuttle, when Han, Luke, Leia, and Chewie are looking at the Death Star 2... While heading to the moon of Endor, I wish that Han stated in a line of dialogue about the bigger size. Yeah, you know, again, with all of the, you know, like Figurin Dan and the modal nodes. <laughs> no one knew. That wasn't canonical. <laughs> you know, by the way, that's the band in the cantina in, in Star Wars. There's been so much retconning of these things. The Tantive 4 Is it the Tantive? So I, I was calling it the Tantive, but then, then I was corrected. It was the Tantive which makes sense to me. The Tantive IV, I think, the Rebel Blockade Runner at the beginning. I don't know. There's so many new names to take care of. I mean, I liked it back in the day when, you know, you could see in the credits that the band was called Max Rebo and the Rebo Band or Cy Snoodles and the Rebo Band or something. But, you know, they change these things around. What are you going to do? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well... You know what, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle beings, kind souls, people across. Oh, hang on, we've got. Um, let me uh, let me jump back here. Eric Gant sends in a tip and says, "Greetings, Starfighter. You have been selected by the Star League to defend the frontier from Zur and the Kodan Armada. Damn, I'd love to see the effects in that film updated. Just the effects. Leave everything else as is. Well, Eric, you know your you you know your Starfighter, <laughs> and our friend." Um, our friend Nick Markins. I'm actually kind of excited for Nick Markins being able to watch The Last Starfighter for the first time. I mean, look, it's peak 80s. Remember, it came out in 84, so it was pre-Back to the Future. But in a way, it kind of has that kind of vibe to it. You know, Marty McFly, you could easily have changed Lance Guest and, and uh, Michael J. Fox in those movies, and they would have worked. <laughs> um, Ricky Burnett. Oh, there was the big Star Wars toy auction. Ricky Burnett says there was a Star Wars toy auction in the UK today and a Jawa with a plastic cape still in the package sold for 22,000 pounds. You know what? I had a Jawa with a plastic cape, but I took it out of the package. I had a Jawa with a plastic cape. And uh, if I'd known now, you know, that's one of the things I would have done. If I knew what I knew now, I would have gone back in time and told my younger self to not open half of my vintage Star Wars toys. I'll be curious. I mean, 22,000 pounds, that's a lot of money. Somebody just needed it for their collection. Uh, Hassan is here. Hello, Hassan. Chaplin married underage women, so today he would be accused of being a pedophile. On another note, I saw these final hours. Do the right thing and unhinged in a row. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Thanks for recommending these final hours. It's incredible. Yes, I mean, 
where did I put it? Ah, it's right here. Uh, it's an Australian end of the world movie. And uh, it's quite, well, it's not exactly your feel good movie of the year, I'll tell you that. And you know what? If you see, I mentioned another movie called Last Night from Canada. These Final Hours and Last Night are a great apocalyptic t- double bill. Um, Hassan, you know, Chaplin married underage women. Here's the thing. Underage women, just because they're underage, doesn't mean he was a pedof- uh, pedophile. You know, that pedophile uh, assumes children. And remember, back in the day, even 100 years ago, if you were an older man marrying a younger woman, it wasn't that unusual. Not that unusual. Um, so there you go. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle beings, kind souls from across 28 known galaxies, I'm going to bring episode number... 400, it's not even 400, 546 to an end. You know, we were going to have an episode of Whining About Movies tonight, but I'm going to push it till tomorrow. We're going to do The Hills Run Red, assuming Dave can do it. We're doing The Hills Run Red with director Dave Parker as our guest. We're going to do it tomorrow, not Friday. And then Saturday, we're wrapping up. It's Halloween night. We are wrapping up. We're going to have a special Halloween show of Whining About Movies. And um, we're going to talk about The Exorcist. So there you go. Go. I want to thank my moderating staff. We got Joshua Levesque here. Greg Smith is here. MC Blackcap is here. Robert Pariso is here. I hope the Richard, Mr. Derringer is here. The Richard's on the mend. And uh, I want to thank you guys for being here. I want to thank my moderating staff and everybody that's watching. I want to thank everybody for supporting the channel via super chats and tips and all that. You can still remember, become a member, and we get up. We're getting up there. When we get to, I think, 50 members, maybe 30 members or 50 members at certain tiers, we're going to start having daily if not weekly zoom chats and that should be fun and doing a lot more stuff and remember those memberships are allowing us to expand the channel and do more things such as make this movie and um i'm gonna have more about the short story contest coming and we're gonna head into obviously saturday is the 31st of october we have one month left for the film festival including the thanksgiving holiday we've got coming up there too so that's interesting but we're really going to kick the festival into high gear. I got more films to put up, and it's all good. I also want to thank Mike Bod and Greg Smith again for being the the cornerstones of the channel in terms of sane people, because <laughs> I'm certainly not that. And um, the Richard is always having Zoom parties and throwing fun things over on the Whining About Movies Facebook page and the um, Post Geek Singularity Facebook page, so go there and check that out. Um, let's see, what more can I tell you? I don't know. I think that's it. I think that's all I have to tell you. I will be back on the John Campia show tomorrow. We'll be doing this show and whining about movies. So that will be fun. And we're going to do The Hills Run Red, the movie that I produced. Uh, and that, uh, we're going to have director Dave Parker talking about directing a movie. Our second, and then we're moving into, starting on Monday, we're starting our James Bond festival. We're going to watch a movie with every Bond, and on we're going to start with Goldfinger on Monday, followed by On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Actually, it'll be on Tuesday. Goldfinger on Tuesday, On Her Majesty's Secret Service on Thursday, and uh, The Spy Who Loved Me on Saturday. So that's going to be cool. We're going to look at a Bond film from every Bond because we're celebrating Bond month that didn't happen because No Time to Die is, is, is going to make us wait. So, thank you very much. Remember, as always, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I end Rob Observations episode 546. And I say, as always, have a butter knife. Have a better day. <laughs>